In recent years, Hong Kongers have noticed that mainland Chinese restaurant brands like Mi Xue Ice Cream and Tea, Tai R Sauerkraut Fish, and Nong Geng Ji Hunan Home Style Cuisine have popped up in major shopping districts. According to statistics from Hong Kong media outlet Hong Kong One, in the past six months, at least ten mainland dining enterprises have expanded into Hong Kong, opening nearly twenty new outlets. With monthly rent payments estimated at least four million Hong Kong dollars. A friend told me before the new year that there are a lot of vacant shops in Hong Kong, and the cost of renting a shop is relatively low. So during the Chinese New Year holiday, I took our family's hot pot base ingredients to Hong Kong to meet with some friends who are interested in opening restaurants. We also took a closer look at the hot pot market there. Previously, the high rent and labor costs in Hong Kong posed significant barriers to entry for mainland brands. However, in recent years, as Hong Kong's dining and retail sectors have faced setbacks with ongoing declines in some shop rentals, mainland restaurants have seized the opportunity to fill the gaps in Hong Kong's dining scene. Recently, a netizen posted on social media that the mainland tea drink brand Shu Yi Tea Licious is about to open its first store in Hong Kong near Mong Kok East Station, though the opening date is still to be determined. Compared to Shu Yi Tea Licious, the king of ice creams, Mi Xue Ice Cream and Tea, has moved into Hong Kong even faster. Last December, Mi Xue opened its first store in Mong Kok, and there's still a long line outside. Within a 500 meter radius of Mong Kok MTR station, it has become a hub for mainland tea drink brands. It's only 3:30 in the afternoon, and legend has it that Mi Xue needs to sell 700 cups a day to cover its rent. Let's see if this business can actually sell 700 cups a day. There are already no fewer than 50 people in line. It looks like Mi Xue's first store in Hong Kong is quite a success, and it's also received a lot of support from Hong Kongers. While mainlanders continue to pour in, Hong Kongers are desperately trying to leave. In the past three years, 530,000 people have left Hong Kong. According to the latest data from the Hong Kong Immigration Department, these three years have seen the most severe population loss since 1959. On one hand, Hong Kongers are fleeing. On the other, mainlanders are rushing in. What exactly is happening in Hong Kong? What exactly is happening in Hong Kong? Simply put, Hong Kong is rapidly becoming mainlandized. Since the implementation of the Hong Kong version of the national security law in July 2020, a new wave of immigration has erupted, with hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers moving overseas. According to the Youth Dashboard statistics released by the Hong Kong Home and Youth Affairs Bureau in January, the young working population in Hong Kong plummeted by 200,000 from 2018 to 2022. Additionally, according to the passenger flow statistics released by the Hong Kong Immigration Department, from July 2020 to June 2023, a total of 6.33 million Hong Kong residents departed through the airport, with only 5.8 million returns. This indicates a net outflow of 530,000 people over these three years, marking the most severe population loss in nearly 60 years. This trend is particularly pronounced among young people in their 20s, including high-end professionals like doctors, nurses, teachers, and financial sector workers. The loss of students in Hong Kong is also severe, according to the Student Number Statistics Report released by the Hong Kong Education Bureau. Nearly 68,000 primary and secondary school students left Hong Kong between September 2019 and September 2022. With 27,000 departing in the year from September 2021 to September 2022 alone, the dropout wave has even spread to kindergartens. By September 2022, at least 6,500 kindergarten students had dropped out in the past year, a dropout rate of about 6.31 percent, reaching a recent high. Media reports indicate that 5,154 children, which is 80 percent of these, were in lower kindergarten K2. Who withdrew before moving up to higher kindergarten K3 was a dropout rate of 9.69 percent, meaning that roughly one in ten K2 students chose not to continue their education in Hong Kong. 
A survey by the Hong Kong Public Opinion Research Institute in March 2022 on the reasons for emigration found that 35% of respondents cited personal freedom, and 58% expressed a lack of confidence in the political future. However, the rapid outflow of Hong Kong's population aligns perfectly with Beijing's intentions. On April 30th, Hong Kong Chief Executive Zhang Li stated at a press conference that by the end of March this year, about 110,000 talents had come to Hong Kong through various talent programs. The Top Talent Pass scheme, specifically, received about 77,000 applications, with 62,000 approved. He estimated that the scheme could contribute about 34 billion Hong Kong dollars to the economy annually. Equivalent to about 1.2 percent of the local GDP, the Top Talent Pass scheme was first proposed in Zhang Li's policy address in October 2022. In this report, Li noted that Hong Kong's local labor force had decreased by about 140,000 from 2019 to 2021, prompting the introduction of four measures to attract foreign talents, including the Top Talent Pass scheme. The relaxation of the general employment policy, and the mainland talents and professionals scheme. By the end of 2022, Hong Kong officially opened applications for the Hong Kong Top Talent Pass scheme. Reportedly, it received over 10,000 applications in just seven weeks since its launch, with two thirds coming from China and one third from overseas, and over 90 percent of these overseas applications reportedly being of Chinese nationality. To this day, Hong Kong immigration remains a hot topic on social media platforms like Xiao Hong Shu and TikTok. Did you come to get an ID card? It costs 230 Hong Kong dollars to get a Hong Kong ID card. I didn't get any discount, and I've spent nearly tens of thousands of Hong Kong dollars here, trying to give a little boost to Hong Kong's economy. Do you think it's worth it? Today, of Hong Kong's total population of over seven million, nearly four million are new Hong Kongers, predominantly from mainland China, rapidly filling the vacancies left by the immigration wave of locals. However, as hundreds of thousands of middle-class professionals, including seasoned businessmen, doctors, nurses, engineers, and financial professionals, have migrated to the West, there remains a noticeable disparity in the quality of talent. Between the existing population and many of the new mainland immigrants, if the Hong Kong government continues to merely facilitate the influx of mainlanders without implementing effective strategies to attract international professionals, Hong Kong's competitiveness will continue to decline. Around April this year, platforms like Weibo and Douyin saw a surge of posts discussing the topic. Hong Kong's population rebounds to the 7.5 million mark. Despite rapid population loss in recent years, this year marked a return to peak numbers, officially exceeding 7.5 million, setting a new record. These posts attributed the rise to the influx of high-end Chinese talents and praised the Hong Kong government's talent importation program for its effectiveness, with a clear intent of political propaganda. On May 7th, during the opening ceremony of the Global Talent Summit. Hong Kong's chief executive Zhang Li proudly highlighted the success of the Top Talent Pass scheme, clearly pleased with its outcomes. Why Hong Kong? Why relocate here? Because Hong Kong is where talents gets to thrive and grow in a world-class economy, in Asia's world city. Thanks to our one country, two systems principle, Hong Kong is bestowed with. Prime business prospects and far-reaching promise. Hong Kong is the only place in the world where the global advantage and China advantage come together in a single city. Beijing authorities are actively promoting a major blood transfusion for the Hong Kong population, with claims that the CCP aims to transform nearly half of Hong Kong's population into mainlanders by 2046. At which point Hong Kong would become a satellite city to Shenzhen. This aligns with Xi Jinping's advocacy for Hong Kong's integration into the Greater Bay Area, with Shenzhen positioned as the driving force of the region. To facilitate this major demographic shift, the government under Zhang Li is aggressively launching large-scale infrastructure projects, 
while also opening doors wide with various talent policies to attract mainland immigrants. Developing new districts and competing for talent are complementary policies aimed at achieving the grand plan of integrating Hong Kong more closely with the mainland. Ji Da, a political commentator based in the United States, said that many anti communist Hong Kongers are descendants of mainland Chinese who migrated to Hong Kong many years ago. The CCP is not concerned about these individuals leaving because it can easily replace them by exporting a portion of its population to fill the vacancies. He stated that the CCP had planned years ago to replace Hong Kong's elites with mainlanders, a concept introduced during Donald Tsang's tenure as chief executive by pro Beijing factions. Who advocated for a population exchange to replace local Hong Kongers with mainland elites. Subsequently, CCP media heavily promoted the notion of new Hong Kongers, categorizing residents into old and new groups with a policy of out with the old, in with the new. Following the massive June 2019 anti extradition bill protests that deeply shook the CCP, the policy of keeping the land, not the people was further solidified. Wu Wenxin, a China affairs expert based in Germany, told Vision Times that this practice by the CCP is not new. For instance, the claim of high autonomy in Tibet, where Tibetans govern Tibet, is equally deceptive. In reality, the CCP plans to keep Tibet, not the Tibetans. The Dalai Lama and his followers fleeing to other countries do not concern the CCP. Which deliberately populates Tibet with Han Chinese, eventually outnumbering local Tibetans in Tibet. The same applies to Xinjiang, where initial promises of a high autonomy for Uyghurs governing Uyghurs were misleading. Now, Xinjiang has a significant Han Chinese population. The CCP views Hong Kong as a golden goose but wants to replace it because the Hong Kongers do not comply. Pro Beijing media described the recent influx of Chinese to Hong Kong as a surge, but a prominent financial channel host, Mr. Sun, sarcastically suggests it should be called a chive wave, referring to newcomers as easy targets for exploitation like harvesting chives. After 2019, many Hong Kongers sold their properties en masse for emigration, causing a slump in the property market. In recent years, news of homeowners slashing prices to sell properties has been common, and property transactions have dropped significantly, with 2023's volumes being described as pitiful. However, as Beijing aggressively promotes the settlement of Chinese talents in Hong Kong and the local government relaxes policies on mainlanders purchasing property, eliminating additional stamp duties, therefore, property prices effectively received a 15% discount straight up. Sun says these policies inadvertently create an escape route for Hong Kongers struggling to sell their properties, addressing the difficulty in finding buyers in recent years. The new mainland immigrants effectively become the new targets, hence his term, chive wave. Regarding the CCP's goal of keeping Hong Kong not the people, Wu Wenxin states that the future will see many new Hong Kongers who do not speak Cantonese or share Hong Kong values. With special talent schemes being the last straw. At that point, the international community will no longer distinguish between Hong Kong and mainland Chinese passport holders, viewing those who choose to stay as aligning with mainland China. Western societies will then cease their support programs for Hong Kongers, and holding a Hong Kong passport will no longer be advantageous. As mainland Chinese enthusiasts for Hong Kong immigration face a gradual mainlandization of Hong Kong, They too may find themselves in a severe rat race situation like in China today, with the overall economy possibly collapsing faster due to competition for Chinese resources. Faced with the CCP's increasing control over Hong Kong, even at the expense of economic development to enforce communism, Western countries are highly concerned. Gregory May, the U.S. Consul General in Hong Kong and Macau, Spoke at a webinar hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies on May 9th, noting that the tightening internet censorship in Hong Kong is diminishing the city's appeal as a global financial hub. May pointed out that Hong Kong authorities have embarked on a slippery slope of internet content censorship, raising the question where are the boundaries? 
He argued that an open internet is a major advantage for Hong Kong compared to mainland China, where strict internet controls make it very difficult for foreign companies. May emphasized that the U.S. is interested in stabilizing relations with Hong Kong, but this requires Hong Kong leaders to stop the democratic backsliding and harsher crackdowns. He explained that the U.S. government hopes Hong Kong authorities will withdraw the arrest warrants against Hong Kongers in the U.S. and cease the suppression of Hong Kongers. Particularly concerned about the cases and sentencing of media tycoon Jimmy Lai and the 47 pro-democracy figures. Shortly after the seminar, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs office in Hong Kong issued a statement denouncing May's remarks as blatantly supporting anti-China and destabilizing forces like Jimmy Lai, criticizing interference in Hong Kong's internal affairs, and advising the U.S. to recognize reality soon. Just a day before May's seminar on May 8th. The High Court of Hong Kong ruled in favor of the government, issuing an injunction against the anti-extradition movement song "Glory to Hong Kong." Declaring the widely recognized spiritual national anthem of Hong Kongers a banned song, henceforth broadcasting, performing, or spreading the song in any form is prohibited. Why ban "Glory to Hong Kong"? The government argues that the lyrics contain slogans that could be inciting secession, and that the song had recently been mistakenly perceived as Hong Kong's national anthem, thus insulting China's national anthem, the March of the Volunteers, and causing severe damage to China and the Special Administrative Region. Last year, a 69-year-old man in Hong Kong was sentenced to 30 days in prison for playing "Glory to Hong Kong" multiple times on the street with a traditional Chinese instrument. The Arhu, the judge claimed the song promoted Hong Kong independence, thereby involving national security, and that the ruling was intended to convey to the public that spreading the song has serious consequences. The suppression of "Glory to Hong Kong" is just the tip of the iceberg in the CCP's unscrupulous efforts to completely control freedom of speech in Hong Kong. On the eve of World Press Freedom Day on May 2nd. The Wall Street Journal announced its relocation of the Asian headquarters from Hong Kong to Singapore, significantly reducing editorial staff in Hong Kong. It is rumored that part of the editorial team will be relocated to Singapore, with over half of the Hong Kong staff being laid off. Editor in Chief Emma Tucker, in an internal memo to staff on May 2nd, announced the withdrawal from Hong Kong without specifying the reasons. But she emphasized that the decision was made as many of the companies we cover have done. The memo did not mention Hong Kong's Article 23 legislation, political climate, or business environment, leaving the real reasons well understood by all. Media scholar Du Yaoming said that under the national security law, political and economic figures from China no longer dare to speak freely in Hong Kong, and with European and American business executives increasingly moving to Singapore. Industry sources have become much scarcer. Moreover, Hong Kong's protections for journalistic activities are weakening. For instance, leaking state secrets is a major national security crime, directly affecting reporters' freedom to gather news. Faced with such conditions, the media's first response is to relocate to Singapore to report on Hong Kong from abroad, and the second response might be to simply report from China, as what cannot be said in China now cannot be said in Hong Kong either. Since the Wall Street Journal already has a headquarters in Beijing, the existence of the Hong Kong office has become largely redundant. Du Yaoming further stated that in Hong Kong, whether big or small, policies often require approval from Beijing before implementation. Reporters stationed in Hong Kong are unlikely to know the direction of policies. Du Yaoming said, from the national security law to trash fees, the SAR government seems helpless. Unable to decide many things until Beijing steps in. In other words, even if you can frequently interact with the highest levels of the Hong Kong government, it doesn't mean you can understand the government's direction and policy thinking. It might be better to understand Hong Kong directly from Beijing than trying to understand it from Hong Kong. Besides, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times had already moved its Hong Kong branch to Seoul, South Korea, and Radio Free Asia closed its Hong Kong office in April. This highlights the continued deterioration of press and freedom of speech in Hong Kong, following the strong push by Beijing and the local government for national security legislation.